Since the dawn of modern warfare, commanders on the battlefield have relied upon their most agile warriors to keep their eyes on the target, engage the enemy, and know the enemy's every move. With the readiness to accept a challenge and stay sharp in the face of danger, the soldiers of Military Occupational Specialty Cavalry Scout are invaluable assets to our nation's army. Recognized as force multipliers, the men and women of this MOS play a vital role in military operations. They're the ones that go out and gather information for officials to make plans on what the military is doing at the time. As a cavalry scout, you will serve or assist as a member of a scout team, squad, or platoon in reconnaissance, security, and other combat operations. Using cover and concealment to conduct reconnaissance, the cavalry scout gathers vital information for the planning of military missions and the deployment of forces into battle. Cavalry scouts conduct terrain, infrastructure, civilian, and threat analysis land navigation and route selection, 
and provide detailed reports on threat location, capabilities, and movement. We are the eyes and ears of the force. Cavalry scouts are qualified in individual and crew-served weapons, such as the 25 millimeter and 50 caliber heavy machine guns, light machine guns, and grenade launchers, in addition to anti-armor weapons. As a crew member, Cavalry Scouts operate and maintain military vehicles, like the highly mobile multi-wheeled vehicle, or Humvee, the Bradley Fighting Vehicle, and the Striker. They're specifically trained on several different types of optics, different tactics, uh, techniques, and procedures in order to get the reconnaissance. Soldiers attend approximately 16 weeks of one station unit training at the U.S. Army Armor School located at Fort Benning, Georgia, where they become disciplined, fit, and competent cavalry scouts. Whether they're taking part in squad maneuvers, target practice, or tactical training exercises, cavalry scouts are constantly refining their skills to keep themselves sharp. After successful completion of training, soldiers may be assigned to a scout platoon in the operational force as a scout, driver, or gunner. You have to want to do it, and if you want to do it and you train hard for it, you can do anything you put your mind on. It's a rewarding career choice for qualified soldiers. As a cavalry scout, soldiers may have this opportunity to pursue additional military training in a variety of different areas. Serving in this position, soldiers may also have the opportunity to apply for and earn national certifications and credentials through the Army's Credentialing Opportunities online website, further assisting in the transition from the military to the civilian employment sector. At a young age, you learn how to take on a lot of responsibilities. Also, you become physically fit, mentally fit, and you learn how to push yourself to limits you didn't know you could reach before. Discipline, physical and mental stamina, tactical and technical proficiency, and the ability to work as a member of a cohesive team are essential characteristics of a cavalry scout. Earn your Stetson and Spurs by continuing a proud tradition as the eyes and ears of the commander on the integrated battlefield. Military Occupational Specialty, Cavalry Scout. All right, we are live with our next soldier of the hour. We have our special guest, Command Center Major Franco from Fort Polk, Louisiana. Congrat uh, I was about to say congratulations for coming on our show, but thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you guys are kind of wondering why I have this funny hat on my head. Well, it's a Stetson, and it's a sign of a Calvary Scout, a 19 Delta. And Sergeant Major is down at Fort Polk, Louisiana with 3rd Brigade, 10th Mountain. And today we're going to be talking about his career, his prestigious career. This man, I mean, I'm reading his bio and it's going on forever. This guy has done from everything. When I say this guy, I meant this Sergeant Major. Has done from everything from uh, Airborne School to Jump Master School, Pathfinder School, Ranger School. Um, he's with been with the Audie Murphy Association, the St. George, um, and the St. Am I saying this right? The Barber? St. Barbara. That's Barber, yeah. yeah. So our major, you've been hailed, you've been uh, a combat hero, you've done a lot in your career, and that's why I have asked you to join us. Also, you've been from Fort Polk, Louisiana. I worked with you, so I got to get my, my people on. Um, so uh, if you don't mind, can you start us off and tell us a little bit about you? Well, uh, uh, first of all, when I, I want to thank you for the opportunity. I think of what you're doing as, a, as an Army recruit is a very important mission for the Army to maintain the strength of the Army uh, by bringing quality recruits into the Army. So thank you for that, uh, Senator Anderson. So for me, uh, Obviously, I came in the Army a long time ago, uh, 28 years ago, 28 May 1992. Uh, I joined uh, out of uh, Queens, New York. I'm originally from Long Island, New York, uh, but I entered the Army from Queens, New York uh, in 1992. I went through basic training in AIT, uh, or what is known as one-station unit training, 
at Fort Knox, Kentucky back then at the one station unit training for 19 Deltas now done at Fort Bend in Georgia. But back when I, I, I came into there and was on a Fort Knox. Uh, so I spent there about four months in the basic training and uh, advanced individual training and uh, PCS from there to Germany. So Germany, Baumholder, Germany, 2nd Armor Division was my first duty station. Spent three years there. Uh, after my time was up with the fir uh, first armor division in uh, in Baumholder, Germany, I PCS the fourth tour of Georgia with the third infantry division. I uh, spent a couple of years there with the third infantry division, then PCS to the Republic of South Korea, and served with the four seventh cavalry. Uh, Gary Owen uh, spent a year a year and some change in Korea, then went mm -hmm. back to third infantry division, the fourth tour of Georgia. Uh, spent a couple of years with uh, fourth tour, deployed to Iraq with that unit. Uh, during the invasion, and then I uh, went to uh, Fort Knox after the deployment, after an 18-month tour in Iraq. It was the first tour, and I spent uh, 15 months in uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, after that first deployment. Got promoted, made sergeant first class, so I PCS uh, to Fort Richardson, Alaska, uh, to 140th Cap, which was part of the 4th Brigade 25, uh, 25th Infantry Division uh, at the uh, Fort Richardson, now now known as Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson, uh, and spent uh, two three years there. Then went back to Fort Knox, PCS, uh, where I became uh, a first sergeant for the NCU Academy at Fort Knox. Uh, spent uh, a couple years there, and then I PCS to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, and spent three uh, I think four years at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, uh, going from all brigades, first, second, third division headquarters. Uh, then I got, select, <laughs> got selected to the Southern Mayors Academy, and uh, and then I went to Germany back again almost 20 years later, where I was the uh, Squadron Sergeant Major for 1st uh, Cavalry 91st, or the yeah, 1st Squadron 91st Cavalry uh, stationed in Grafenbeer. A lot of great times in that unit. We went all over Europe, a lot of travel opportunities there. Um, and then obviously now my current assignment is uh, right here at Fort Polk, Louisiana with the 3rd Brigade, 10 Mountain Division, the Mountain Patriots, best brigade in the Army. And Go that, Patriots! Yeah, that, that's that's my biography. So 20 years, I've been to you know several schools, as you mentioned. I, uh, I am married, happily married, uh, two beautiful boys. Uh, they're men now. Uh, and uh, just looking forward to what's, what's next for me in the Army. Mm -hmm. So again, like I said, this is one of the reasons why I wanted you to come on to our show is because within your time frame, you know, the army is not forever. It's just for right now. That's my saying. Yeah. Uh, you have had an extraordinary career. You've gone to places that if you have never joined the army, very few people have the money to travel and sightsee. Where being stationed in Germany, Alaska, Korea, you're already there and you're it's a mecca you could you know jump from place to place to place and you're not paying uh hotel fees rental fees you know you're there already and you just have to take your time yes. from your barracks or from your uh work and go sightsee travel see the world on the army's dime that's i mean incredible and you've been to georgia or excuse me georgia uh germany twice so yes. for a total of six years how many countries have you visited so while I was in Germany officially on the job, it was a total of 23 countries traveling. I think it was a total of like 42, uh, if you count some of the kind of Eastern, you know, Eastern European countries. So we, we did get to see a lot of different countries. But uh, with the job alone, we went to uh, 20, 20 some different countries uh, throughout Europe and uh, down into going into, into Asia. Uh, so it was, now, it was a great time. Now, do you think if you never joined the military, do you think you would have been able to see those countries? No, probably not. I'd probably still be uh, in Queens, New York, working in a factory somewhere, uh, uh, not not really uh, having a lot of opportunity to see much outside of New York. Same here. If I never joined the military, I wouldn't be able to have the extraordinary career that I have had, too. I would be in the same city, yeah. stuck in a rut. So it's just amazing of all the benefits you could get for, you know, doing just doing your job in the military. It's yeah. great. Um, so I have a laundry list of questions for you. Um, and then I have viewers that were watching your commercial and they have, uh, questions too, that we're going to ask later on the show. Um, but, uh, if you are watching this live hashtag live, if you're rewatching this hashtag rewatch, 
Um, and if you guys have a question, Sergeant Major, he has 20 something years of experience. He will be able to answer your question. He is in a prestigious position, a command Sergeant Major of a brigade, which is pretty big. Um, he oversees 4, 000, approximately 4,500 soldiers in his footprint. So uh, we have everybody from all walks of life um, in our unit. So he's he's one of the main guys that can answer your questions if you have questions, even if it's not related to Cavalry Scout, which is the MOS is 19 Delta. But we're going to talk about his career and his MOS. So to start it off, what made you look into the Army versus any other branch? And then once you picked the Army, obviously you're wearing an Army uniform. Why 19 Delta? Why Cavalry Scout? Yeah, so uh, I was uh, back then. I was, I think, I was seventeen. So right after high school, um, I used to work in the city of New York, and every time it was a matter of convenience. I just wanted to get out of get out of the the the, the New York City way of life because it was just a grind. It was work back home, work back home. So I remember taking the train, taking the subway uh, from from Queens into the city, and every time we used to go past the recruiting station, it was an army recruiting station. So. I went in and, you know, the first time they, they, they proposed to me the job that I was that, that I was the best qualified for. So, yeah, I can see myself doing that. Uh, so it was an easy, easy option for me. And at the time, there was a large demand for Cavalry Scouts because we were just coming out of the Cold War. So the Army was very in a very heavy industrial mindset, you know. So they were relying on tanks and, and, uh, and the armor fighting vehicles because of the threat reversion, the threat in Europe, which still remains now. I think the army's gone 180 on that again, so that's where that's where the focus is now. So I think uh, for those that are interested in, in joining the 19 uh, CMF, as we call it, or combat management field, because you got 19 Delta, 19 Kilo, and obviously you have the commissioning branch, which is a 19 Alpha. Does offer you some options because that is one of the things that the army, big army, is focused on is how to uh, uh, gain momentum in the armor force again. Oh, and then uh, just some trivia fact that I've heard that the Marines, if you guys are looking into the Marines and you're looking into that area of operations, they're giving up their tanks. So if you want to be in the 19 series, the kilos, uh, you might want to look into the Army because they will no longer have their tanks. So just some trivia for you. Um, was the process to talk to a recruiter and get signed up pretty easy or were you nervous talking to uh, a recruiter in the station? You know what? It's been so long ago. It, I I can't remember, but you know, to me, it was it was fairly easy. Like I remember stopping there on a Friday, and I think like a week later, you know, the recruiter had me already ready to go. So it it was uh, last week of April, and uh, and I shipped out. I started basic training on May twenty eighth. So in less than thirty days, I went from uh, you know working in a factory in New York, making minimum wage, uh, not having a whole lot, to you know being on my way, starting my army career at four knots. Uh, a culture shock, nonetheless, because uh, leaving the big city, going into small town Kentucky back then was really small town, uh, where Fort Knox is. So it was a, it was a little bit of an adjustment, but uh, I couldn't have it any other way. Uh, you know, 27 years to look back, and I think it was the best decision that I ever made. So I'm very happy with uh, with with what I've done in the army. Now, uh, Sergeant Major. Uh was your parents supportive of your decision? Did you have other relatives that were naysayers? Uh, was everybody, you know, cheering you on? Because that's a really fast turnaround to get you, <laughs> you know, into the military. Usually it takes a lot longer uh, yeah. because, you know, other people have other issues with their life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, like I said, I, I just wanted to get out of there. Uh, you know, I wanted to do something different. Uh, I know that my mother... Uh, my father was absent from uh, from my life, uh, you know, later later in life. So he was he was absent during that time. Uh, but uh, my mother was sad. Obviously, I didn't want to leave her. But uh, at the end of the day, I thought that you know I had to make my own way so that I could take care of her in turn someday. So uh, yeah, it was hard at the beginning, but um, you know, like I said, you just you just get over it and, and keep driving on. Mm -hmm. Now, Sergeant Major, you said that you qualified for 19 Delta. Was there any other jobs that were available to you at that time? Or was it something that the recruiter said that you just fell in love with it? So really, they play this high-speed video. You know, it was kind of like the one they, they, just, they just showed. But, you know, this one had, like, motorcycles, wind buggies. So they just saw me right out. But I, mean, I did qualify for other 
uh, self-skilled jobs. I think I qualified for 42 Alpha was one of them. Supply was another one. Uh, but in terms of combat arms, that was the only job that they had available uh, that I could qualify. And, you know, I wanted to sign for the adventure and do something different. Uh, you know, if I wanted to do something, uh, a self-skilled job, I think I would have stayed in New York and doing that. But I want to do something for the adventure. So if they have a cousin in the Army before. That's what he recommended. Uh, because of promotions, promotions move faster in the combat arms uh, and, and just uh, job satisfaction. I think uh, the combat arms was the, the way in for me. And uh, the, the one that panned out was a uh, uh, caliber scout. Yep, and that's still true today. Um, most of our combat jobs do have a higher or faster promotion just because we're so vast and so big. Yes, um, and we just need you guys to fill the spot. So promotion uh, is a little, little bit quicker. Uh, now, there is some outliers in there, um, rangers, special forces, and things of that nature. But we could go there a little bit later. Um, can you tell us a little bit? Uh, so you keep, I see in your bio that you keep revolving around Fort Knox. Um, as you know, your leadership training, as your job training, as your basic training. Obviously, Fort Knox no longer houses you guys. It's back at Fort Benning. Yeah. Uh, but can you tell me a little bit about uh, the culture shock from going from a civilian through basic training and then learning your job? How was that? That yeah, was. Uh, it, it was an interesting experience. You know, it, you know, going back, living in a big city, going to. Small town, uh, Radcliffe, Kentucky. I think that's where Fort Knox uh, was at the time. Uh, it was a little bit of an adjustment, uh, but the drill sergeants do a pretty good job. They do shape you and, and kind of and and uh, and they welcome you into the team. Uh, I know it's a lot different now, but I think that the drill sergeant role remains the same, and they're there to to kind of transform your mindset so that you're best suited to enter the military. Uh, so for me, it wasn't it wasn't too much of an adjustment. Um, it was just the, the first week, but after that, like I said, it, it was it was uh, uh, easy easy to do after that. Okay, um, so our major, we have a live question from a Joshua Easton. Um, so we're at the point where we're talking about our jobs, um, and for our viewers, uh, Calvary. Before I ask the question, can you tell us a little bit in your own words what you do as a Calvary Scout? <clears throat> so the uh, the job of a cavalry scout, the, the actual title, um, I can't remember the publication that actually uh, covers it, but it's it's it's, uh, it's known as an armor armor reconnaissance specialist. So you you belong to the armor branch, and uh, and your job is to conduct armor reconnaissance. So you are like a, I think like the video said, you're the eyes and ears. So you're part of a section, you're part of a platoon, you're part of a cavalry troop or a cavalry squadron. And you go out and you conduct reconnaissance and you shape the fight for the larger element behind you. So you have a larger headquarters or a larger formation. So in this brigade combat team, we have a cavalry squadron and their, and their main role is to be ahead of the rest of the maneuver forces so that the rest of the uh, uh, rifle battalions, the infantry battalions, the engineer battalion, the field artillery, the support battalion, uh, they're ahead of them and they're shaping the fight, getting the information just confirming where those enemy templated locations are or, you know, what are the best routes? I think I lost you on, on, on visual, Anderson. No, we're good, Star Major. Oh, yes. I just I just wanted you to be the focus. Okay, okay. So we're good. Uh, so so that's uh, that's what you got to do. So you conduct reconnaissance where there's uh, uh, enemy base or terrain base, uh, conditions base, and you got that information so that the, uh, the planners and the people that do all the uh, – all, all, all the staff work at a larger headquarters can complete the plan so the maneuver force can can uh, finish the fight, if that makes sense. It sure does. Well, it makes sense to me because we've been in for a minute, but um, hopefully, viewers, if you need a tweaking of that assessment, put your comments down. This is a live interview. This, is, this man's here to inform you to get a better understanding of the job that he loves to do in the military. Uh, so... Since we have a breakdown of what a cavalry scout does, um, we have a live uh, question from a Joshua Easton. Uh, he's looking into infantry. Now, obviously, you've been working with all types of other jobs in the military, and there's always this big rivalry. Who's better, an infantry guy, 11 Bravo, or a 19 Delta a cavalry scout? Care to comment on that? Yeah, I think it depends on the individual. You know, it, it really depends on what you want to do. 
so if, if, if you want to be a, 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 rif a rifleman and walk a lot, because uh, that's what infantry does, you want to walk a lot, then you want to join the infantry. If you don't want to walk a whole lot and use vehicles and have some, uh, some uh, fire and protection with an armor vehicle to get you as close to the fight where you need to be and then take care of business, then probably 19 Delta is the way to go. But uh, either one of them, you know, 11 Bravo or 19 Delta, those are both uh, very prestigious uh, uh, military occupational specialties in the military. You will just have to decide. <laughs> so there you go. Hey, you could, you know what? You could join one MOS, one job, and let's say you don't like it and you qualify for another, you can change your job in the military. It's very possible. And if you watch my other videos, you, I've talked to quite a few people who have gone different MOSs or have even gone warrant officer or done green to gold. It's just your prerogative and what you want to do. We are a very diverse uh, organization. We want to see you grow and mature into the leader you could be. Yeah. So, yeah. our major, you talked about all these awesome duty stations. Within these duty stations, you've got uh, schoolings, not only leadership schoolings, but can you talk a little bit about um, the time that you were in Germany and then go into some of the courses that you have earned, uh, the Airborne School, Jumpmaster course, uh, Pathfinder and Ranger School, um, and just discuss about some pros and cons of the places that you've done, the jobs that you hold in those locations. Yeah, so a, a lot of the schools that, uh, that, I, that I've gone to and a lot of the schools that you will see once you join the Army, a lot of schools that you will, that you will go to, they mainly gravitate to the job that you do. So uh, very seldom uh, you have the opportunity to go to school uh, that has no application in the job you do. Uh, so uh, for me, being a, in an airborne organization, in an airborne cavalry squadron, we have to be jump masters. We have to be uh, pathfinders. We have to be ranger qualified because of the, the nature of the job that we do. So you're talking about uh, moving a cavalry squadron by aircraft with trucks uh, and, and cavalry troopers, but they're going to get to the fight wearing a parachute. So that requires a very, uh, a very uh, special skill set. And uh, in order to do that, you have to go to the school. So they're very technical. Uh, they're very uh, uh, academic. And obviously, most of these courses are delivered now at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, at either the infantry school or the armor school, which are they're both part of part of the uh, Maneuver Center of Excellence. Um, in Germany, uh, obviously, there's not a whole lot of uh, uh, school opportunities in Germany unless they come directly. Uh, sometimes the units are able to uh, to coordinate for some of the courses to come by way of what we call a mobile training team which is essentially the school from the schoolhouse coming to your duty station and deliver that instruction there on site. Sometimes it's more cost yep. effective. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I've done those for combatives. We go out there for 30 days or however long the course is. Yep. Teach your class, take the time off and go explore the country. I mean, I will do that in a heartbeat. Throw me back at uh, being a combatives instructor. Rock, that is so, so dead on, Sergeant Major. Sorry. I just had to put that out there. It is yes. a team. I forgot you're you're at level three, right, or level four? Level four, yeah. I'm staying away from you. You're, you're probably yeah. Well, now three and four are combined to master combative school. For a shout out for all my instructors down there, I miss you guys. I will go back there in a heartbeat and a blink of an eye. It's truly one of the amazing programs that the army has. That's a kept secret that needs to be blasted, and everybody needs to do it. So I'm sorry, Sergeant Major. And even though you might not have school, you still have travel in Germany. Oh yeah, so. Yeah, so travel, like I said, uh, uh, I did most of my travel on my second on my second assignment because of the job that the unit was in. First time I was uh, I was in Germany, it was times were different. Some of the drawdown. So again, the, the the Berlin Wall had had collapsed, and then East and West Germany had reunited. So a few years a few years later, a few years after a few years after that, um, the army started to draw down. So it went from three hundred thousand troops in Europe down to 30,000, you know, fast forward almost 20 years. And that that's where I went. So that gave me more opportunities because uh, one of the missions for for the two brigades that are stationed in Germany, so you have the 173rd and 2CR, is to uh, is, uh, energize the NATO alliance. So work with allies, work with partners. And that requires that you travel throughout Europe. So Europe's a small continent uh, and, and there's a lot of small countries in between. So you can be some 
some some train up return to make them up. You may be down in Spain or Italy or go up to Norway, Portugal, down to Greece, um, uh, Slovenia. Just a lot of a lot of opportunities, and because of that, uh, I had the opportunity to see Europe, uh, you know, through that lens. And uh, you know, on the time off, you know, I did I did go with my family. We did go to travel. We went, uh, you know, to different places. Went to France. Went to England. So Ireland, Scotland. Uh, we went down to Malta. So a lot of a lot of travel opportunities because, like you said earlier, like Sarah Anderson said earlier, just being in in the center of Europe because being stationed in Germany is is in the center of Europe gives you that opportunity to go in any direction, uh, north, south, east, or west uh, in Europe. Now, Sarah Major, uh, I'm going to backtrack. I think a little bit. Uh, you said that you are married. You have two beautiful kids. Uh, is your wife your high school sweetheart, or where did you meet your wife? So uh, I met my wife uh, at my uh, second duty station down at Fort Stewart. Um, so we met in Savannah, Georgia. Savannah, Georgia. So she's she's almost my my high school sweetheart, but 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 not there yet. Yeah. So traveling around with your wife, going overseas, and then having kids throughout your time, how difficult or how easy was it to have them to have the same experience that you had? Um, was it a little bit tricky at times with schooling or, you know, did it cost more to have your family there with you? Uh, you mean in Europe? Uh, Europe, uh, Alaska, Korea. Um, we're talking about everywhere you've been. Now, obviously, they're not going to be with you on deployments. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, there were times during my career, you know, talking about 20, 20 28 27, 28 years uh, of service. So we, there were times where I had to go places alone. So I went to Korea by myself because that was a, on a company tour. Uh, I had to do uh, a tour at Fort Bragg by myself uh, because uh, my family had to stay at Fort Knox and my kids had to finish high school. So uh, the one thing that you got to remember once you make the decision to join the Army is that at some point uh, you're going to have to make life decisions in the Army. And uh, and sometimes you got to do it in the best interest of your family. And, uh, and sometimes keeping your kids in school in the same school so they're with the same group uh, of people and they graduate, sometimes that, that perhaps may be more important than PCSing with you to Fort Bragg. So, so we have to make those hard decisions at times. Mm -hmm. But for, for the most part, everywhere you've gone, they've gone. And except for some, yes. some personal reasons, they, they were left behind Absolutely. so they could finish their school year. Absolutely. So, so the, the option is always there. You, the, mm -hmm. Your family can go anywhere uh, with you in the Army, especially now. I think there was a point in time where Korea was uh, strictly an unaccompanied. Uh, but I think more and more there are less of those assignments, uh, you know, available. So nine times out of ten, uh, you will PCS and you, you have the option of your family going with you anywhere. Because the mm -hmm. Army is big on family. The Army is... Uh, huge on keeping the family unit together uh, because uh, uh, we know that's the best way to build trust across the formation is how we take care of our soldiers and their families because uh, uh, it matters, right? Because the job that we, that we have is really, is really hard and, uh, and is dangerous. So uh, we know that the, when the leadership believes in the family, believes in the soldiers and their families take care of them, then we know that the soldiers are going to perform at their best. Yep, they have that peace of mind um, and that freedom to to focus on their job and to keep their battle buddies to left and right safe, yes. while you know people in the rear are taking care of their family and have resources if they have questions. So that's another thing that people don't know is that we are a city within a city. We have resources that a civilian will not have at at, at their fingertips. Absolutely. So, Yep. Um, I, and I also heard that your wife at one point was the breadwinner of the family while you were still going through the ranks. So she had a very successful career to herself. It's not that she has to stay at home and be, you know, uh, raising the kids. She or if your spouse is a guy, he, um, yeah. you can have their own careers, uh, go to school, be a successful business person and still raise a family. So the, the family aspect in the military is very has a very solid foundation no you're absolutely yeah. right and i think the army has gone a long way with with that you know offering opportunities for spouses uh, uh to work or just have their own careers and you see that more and more uh, more opportunities for 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 spouses to so seek good employment have good careers 
and you know going back to you know the army being all in with families is one of uh, one of the third priorities from the chief of staff of the army is people uh, and people uh, people in the army come with families and families are part of the people in the army so that's absolutely right and yes my <laughs> wife was was the breadwinner for the family for a long time and things she's now retired said I'm done with it and now and now you're uh, you you're, you're going to be the only breadwinner so she's enjoying uh, her time off and uh, like I said, she worked for a very long time uh, just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, taking care of all of us. Yeah. So, and I got more questions about the family, but we'll kind of wait until later on in the segment. Um, I do have a question from earlier on this week. Um, I didn't get a chance to write down their name, but the question is um, what are, what does your job changes from each position you've held? Now, I know you've been in the military for a long time. And you got to think back in the early days when you were around, you know, a younger junior soldier through your younger years of uh, an NCO. What were those jobs position at each position at each position that you held? What were your, some of your responsibilities and your duties? OK, so the, the best time in the Army was in your first enlistment because, you know, you go from from private to specialist. So everybody knows private to specialist. You don't you don't have a lot of responsibilities and you're literally taking, as we say in the Army, take all directions from the tower. So you have a, a non-commissioned officer, a sergeant or a corporal or staff sergeant that provides that leadership to you and tells you, hey, this is what's going on for the week or the month or day to day. So the, the first enlistment was, was pretty easy. But as you going to going up into the ranks and you become a sergeant then that's when you start to take on some of the responsibilities so you're no longer responsible just for you so private franco was no longer responsible just for him so sergeant franco had other soldiers to look after had equipment that he was signed for had uh, responsibilities to ensure that that equipment was ready and maintained uh, had responsibilities with the soldiers where they lived if they had families making sure that their families were looked after and that responsibility just continues to grow. So when, once you become a, a staff sergeant uh, or, or section leader, squad leader, as, as we call it, in the, in the cavalry or infantry formations, now you're responsible for eight, eight people and their families and all their equipment and everything else, all their requirements uh, from the Army. So uh, as you progress through every position and through the ranks, you're gonna, your responsibilities will increase. You'll be responsible for a lot more uh, but at the same time, it's rewarding because you know that um, the people count on your leadership and, and they count on you to, uh, to ensure that they're taken care of. And most importantly, that we're ready to, to accomplish our mission, whatever that mission may be. Right. So, Sergeant Major, can you go into detail a little bit more on like we talked about leadership and what you're in charge of. But does the job of 19 Delta, the Cavalry Scout, does that change um, what you do at each rank level? Yeah, yeah. So uh, going uh, to the cover to the Calvary Scout uh, perspective, right? So uh, Calvary Scouts uh, are what we call platform platform based, and maybe that's a bad choice of words, but uh, platform based meaning that your 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 job centers around a, a vehicle. So it's either going to be a a uh, Bradley fighting vehicle, it could be a striker reconnaissance vehicle. It could be a joint light tackle vehicle. It could be a Humvee. So you're you're part of the crew. Your section. Uh, so your section has two or three of those vehicles. And then if you are the the staff sergeant or the section leader of that team, you're responsible for all the uh, all the soldiers of that section. So it could be uh, six to eight people, three vehicles, all the equipment that comes with that vehicle, all the weapons or optics. All of that. So that, that that's what you're responsible for. So as a specialist, or let me go back. So from private to specialist, you can expect to be a driver. So you may be a driver of that vehicle, or or you can be just a ground scout or observer, just walking the ground. Uh, you can be a gunner of that of that weapon system, or you could be a gunner dismounted on the ground. And then uh, once you become a sergeant, you become what they call a truck commander or a team leader. So a team leader being on the ground or a truck or vehicle commander once you're mounted. Uh, that, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Well, again, like to me, since I've been in for a minute, like <coughs> I, I'm following you with every step, every rink of the yeah. way. Uh, so for our viewers, if you have a question, feel free to put it down in the comments. Um, you know, Sergeant Major is here to answer those questions for you. Uh, live, might add you. 
Um, and it's the same time every week from four to five uh, Pacific Coast time. Um, and this is your inside knowledge. You have a wealth of information sitting in this man's brain right now. And this is your time to ask the questions. Um, I do have another questions from earlier on this week, and this is going to be a two part question, Sergeant Major. Um, so you just talked about different positions of each rank you're going to hold. Now, does that change when you're in the garrison environment? For my viewers, a garrison environment means uh, in the rear where you do all your training, all your your living, your physical fitness, your shopping and stuff. That's your garrison. Or your field environment, which where we go out in the woods um, and train, or down in a deployment, a combat deployment. Does those does those positions change from e either scenarios? So the the positions are the same. Uh, I think some of the things that your duties and responsibilities are essentially the same. They don't change, but there's some things that you have to do different. Obviously, when you're in garrison. Uh, you're not you're not out in the field, so you're not doing 24-hour ops, and you're not in an austere environment. So, you know, you work a normal duty day. You know, you start with PT, uh, you know, 6:30 to 7:30 or 6:30 to 8, like here at Fort Polk. Then the, you break from PT, and then you go to your next war call, nine o'clock. Uh, you know, first formation or, or whatever you gotta be, whether it's at the motor pool, at the company, at the battalion, whatever your place of duty is. Um, but in the field, it's a little different because, you know, once you go to the field, the, the purpose of going to the field is to train, to train for war. So that means that, uh, you know, the enemy doesn't stop because it's the, you know, it's the end of the duty day. It's a 24-hour operation. So, and you do things different. So it's more, it's more tactically focused and more focused on field craft. Uh, but the responsibilities stay the same. So as a 19 Delta, if you're a section leader in 19 Delta, uh, in the field means that you are on the job around the clock, but obviously you're doing more of your more of your field craft or more more of your field mission, which is uh, three three main missions that the that the cavalry scouts, as part of a larger cavalry organization, are supposed to do. One is a screen, a zone, reconnaissance, area reconnaissance, or a route reconnaissance. So I'm sorry, those are the four four basic missions that a, that a cavalry scout does for the army. So every time you go out to the field, you're going to perform one of those four missions based on what, uh, you know, the higher commander uh, has dictated to that to that cash squadron to perform for that field exercise. So, yeah, the, the, the job requirements are going to be a little different, uh, whereas when you're back in garrison, like Sian Anderson said, uh, because you're not in the field and you may not be training that day, it, it's just like a normal duty day. So you go to PT, that's something that we do every day in Garrison. The Army does PT everywhere from 6.30 to 7.30 or 6.30 to 8 in some places. And then the first work call may be at 9 o'clock or 9.30, depending on where you're stationed at. Uh, and then you get your lunch, one-hour lunch, and then uh, you go back to work 13 to 1,700 uh, tops, and then you're done for the day. Uh, and then you start all over again. And now, as a section leader, you're still responsible for you know, for your 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 soldiers, their equipment, where they live. So as a leader, you know, looking at a at a section leader or a sergeant, you know, they got a little bit more on their plate than when I say that the you know a young private or a, a specialist in the formation. So a normal duty day for a, for a young soldier, a young cavalry scout in the formation may imply, well, today because we came back from the field, we're gonna go in the arms room. We're going to draw our weapons that we use in the field. We're going to clean them today or perform maintenance, make sure that we order parts for those for those, for those those uh, weapon systems that uh, they got damaged in the field. Or we're going to recover our equipment uh, that uh, they got muddy or dirty in the field. Uh, same thing with the vehicles. We're going to do maintenance. So a lot great maintenance involved. There's some other larger Army requirements that we have to do. We do a lot of counseling. That's more of a leadership task. But uh, obviously, we counsel the junior soldiers as well. So you can expect to receive counseling, professional development, telling you, hey, this is how you did in the field. Uh, this is, uh, these are some of the things that, that you're doing really well. This is where I see you, you know, in the, in the next three months, you know, advancing through the ranks. But these are some of the things that we need to address for you to be able to advance to the next rank. Uh, I hope that gives you enough. Yes, it does. Um, 
So, I mean, and this is very important for the public. Uh, it's not like you could just jump in a car and, and start it on and take off. You know, our we work hard, we play hard. Um, so we have to make sure that our equipment is always ready to go. That, you know, let's say we had a long field exercise. Well, you're not just going to put your equipment up and go, you know, go home and sleep and, you know, take a shower. No, we're going to sit there, make sure that our vehicles are prepped, that our weapons are clean because, we might get called back and go right back out for another mission. So we want to make sure that we're always ready to go no matter what time it is. And that's why it's so important to have our maintenance done. Um, and you'll learn if you guys join that, you know, our equipment is our livelihood. We have to make sure it is clean and ready to go. So that's very true. Lots of time in the arms room, lots of time in the motor pool, lots of time with each other, making sure that we are, we are a tool. We want to make sure that our mental health and our physical health is very uh, up to par, should we say. We have a question live. So this is a live question from uh, Joshua Easton. He says, what would you say that's been your biggest accomplishment through your career, Sergeant Major? <laughs> oh, wow. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a big one. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say. I think uh, if there's a lot of things that, I, that I'm proud of, nothing in particular. Uh, I think some of the, the biggest uh, rewards for me is to see uh, uh, young soldiers that came in the Army that are now senior. You know, they're advancing through the ranks or they commissioned to be an officer. They're doing something great with themselves in the Army. I think there's nothing more rewarding, uh, especially uh, where I sit now, just to see that, uh, you know, uh, your leadership, uh, impacted those young soldiers in a positive way to where it motivated, motivated them or inspired them to stay in the Army and, uh, and make the Army a, a career. Yes. And, you know, I like to say that if, uh, if I could lead or train somebody to take over my spot and succeed and excel, then I've done my job as a leader. Now, That's if right. I am a leader where I'm always saying, no, I'm going to be the top dog and you're never going to surpass me, that's a sign of not of a good leader. And you will be able to pick and choose people that you want to mentor, people that you want to emulize, and people that you say, no, you're toxic. I, I'm going to learn from you, but I don't want to be you and I will not treat my soldier what you've done. So there's, a, there's people on the good side and there's people on the bad side. We're such a large organization and you're going to have to draw from who you like and who you dislike, but you're using, it's always training. You're, you're growing from everybody. So, um, sorry, Major, uh, I got another question for you. And this is from earlier on the week. I got a whole laundry list of questions. <laughs> um, so for a 19 Delta, what types of school does the Army give you to advance your knowledge in this MLS? So the... Uh Best way to put a 19 Delta, you're you're a hybrid, uh, a hybrid soldier of two branches. So you go to a lot of the infantry courses that are available to you to go, uh, and you also have the armor school courses that you can go. Uh, so going back to Fort Benning, because Fort Benning's were most of the training that uh, as a 19 Delta you will require. So you have several courses. So um, uh, there's the Army Reconnaissance course. I think it's taught at the Armour School now. It was formerly known as the Scout Platoon Leaders Course a long time ago when I first came in the Army. Uh, so that's one of the courses that will be available uh, for a Cavalry Scout to go. Um, if you're going heavy, uh, meaning that you're going to be working on a Bradley or a Striker reconnaissance vehicle or a, a Striker <clears throat> infantry vehicle, you, you can perhaps go to Master Gunner, Master Gunner School. So the Army isn't is in large demand of master gunners. So master gunner is basically your subject matter expert on those large weapon systems for tanks, Bradleys, or armor fighting vehicles. Um, obviously, you have the infantry school side of the house. Uh, under the infantry school, you have ranger school. <clears throat> Sniper school is always available. So there's a lot of course opportunities uh, for for uh, for soldiers that join in 19 Delta can expect to go. So really, it's up to you up to the soldier, how motivated and dedicated he he or she is uh, to attain all those courses that are available. Mm -hmm. Here in 310, oh. we, don't, we don't deny anyone uh, from going to school. So everybody wants to go to school here in this brigade, it's thumbs up, hey, you're going. Yep, 
that I've seen with my own eyes. We want you to do it. We will never stop you from furthering your career, not only your job, but your education. The Army is huge on civilian education. Saying that, Sergeant Major, are you, what are you, what is your, uh, do you have your associate degree? Are you working on your bachelor's degree? What are you doing with your education? Yeah, so um, the, my, my degree has been, a, has been a long time coming. Uh, that, that's been one of my weaknesses uh, because uh, my ability to manage my time, the very little time that I have and choosing between family and the Army and then college. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm close to finally completing my uh, my my bachelor's degree. I'm a few uh, uh, credit hours away. So if the time comes to retire in a couple of years, I have my degree on top of my, uh, you know, the time that I serve in the army with some of those uh, uh, certifications that you can get just by doing this job uh, and hopefully be more marketable in the civilian civilian market uh, should I retire in a few years. But, yeah, so I'm almost almost there. But. Uh, you know, th this job, you know, just being honest with uh, everybody that's watching, uh, this job takes a, takes a lot of extra work. But really, it, it's on you as a young soldier, because going back to the initial statement, as you progress through the ranks, the job doesn't get any easier. So that's the difference between the Army and a civilian job. You know, if you're the boss in a, in a civilian company, uh, you know, the boss kind of, you know, gets a, a normal schedule. In the Army, your, your workload will increase by you know by virtue of your duty position and your duty position is determined by the rank you hold so you will have less time so the best advice is as soon as you come in the army i think the army is shaped some of those policies now to where you you can start receiving college tuition immediately right see right after at sergeant major yeah so you can start uh you know signing up for classes because you're not going to have more time uh, as you progress through the ranks so do it while you're while you're early in your years in the army Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, because you're only as a young soldier of any MOS, any job in the Army, as a young soldier, your only job is to be a master in your craft. You're not in charge of anybody else. So you have the time on your free time to sit there and get your college done. And it's free in the military. How can you right. pass it up? Sergeant Major, are you paying any money out of your pocket for your degree? Nope, I'm not paid a, a single dollar on on, uh, on my college degree. So the Army pays nope. for all of it. Um, you know, it's so, like uh, tuition assistance. Uh, I forget what the cap is. It's what five five thousand dollars a year, or something like that. Four thousand, our major. Yeah, Four thousand a year. So yeah. So I think uh, for me, um, on my workload, that's more than enough. Uh, so I never exceed my TA. And you know, I, every time that I get every 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 small window, so I look at the calendar. I see what the brigade is doing. So, well, this window might give me a couple of months where I can uh, dedicate a few hours of the week to 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 put on this class. So, mm -hmm. and you're knocking off a little bit at a time, and I'm I'm in the same boat. I I am married to my job. I love yeah. the army so much. I always try to figure out what I could do to improve my community or my job or my battle buddies still left and right. So, I mean, I'm so passionate of this job. I'll spend hours and hours and it's so hard to take the time out to focus on self-development, but it is highly recommended in the military. It's actually promotion points. You could get yes. up the ladder uh, for boards to, to receive the next rank. Um, if you have college or if you're working towards your college, for an example, if you have two qualified candidates going to the board, one has college, one does not have college, the one that does have college or working towards his degree or her degree, they're going to get selected for promotion because it shows that they are a motivator. They are a self go getter. They will, you know, they will take the time out to improve themselves. We want smarter soldiers in our today's army. So, yeah. I mean, that, 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 that's a fact. That's a fact. So one of the things that the senior leadership of the army, they always talk about, you know, improving the human dimension. So the, the soldier of today and, in, in the near future, we'll have to be uh, more intelligent uh, just because of the challenges and how the world will be a lot different from the time when, when I grew up. And, uh, and that's going to require that, uh, that we develop uh, our cognitive skills and, you know, taking college classes is a way to do so. So, yeah, that's right on. And, and really mm -hmm. goes back to managing your time uh, because that's the one thing that you don't have enough and, and, the, uh, and you can get back is time. Yep. That is that is true. There's only 24 hours in a day, and then you got to start it all over again. Yeah. Sergeant Major, I got some more questions. I'm going to try to uh, fire these off as quickly as I can because we're getting low on our time. 
Okay. So it, what advice would you give somebody that's looking into this job of the 19 Delta timeframe or job positioning, should I say? Yeah, it, it does. It, it does. If that's what you want to do, hey, go, go in it, go in it hard. And, uh, you know, make, uh, make, make the best that, that, that you can do in, in a basic training and uh, advanced individual training, or as we call the one station unit training, which is both things put together. Then just give it your best because uh, they do have this, uh, this program for the 19 Delta and 19 Kilo, because uh, we can't forget about the 19 Kilo brothers. Uh, they got this uh, program that's called Excellence in Armor. Uh, so if you you score very well in your PT test, I forgot what the score is now. They probably change it. Uh, it's been a long time uh, since since I did EIA. Uh, your weapons qualification has to be expert, and then all the rest of the tasks uh, you're gonna do while you're in basic training and AIT. Uh, but at the end, when you come out at the end, then you get this uh, 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 special skill identifier uh, that basically enrolls you in what we call the excellence in armor program. So all that is is to identify you, hey, this this is a top top soldier from his basic training in IT class. We need to put him or her on the fast track. So you'll be uh, more competitive for promotions and it'll carry you a long way. It'll carry you to, to where I'm at right now. So in the sergeant major room when they're looking at you know the next sergeant major for the next level of up, that uh, that excellence in armor is a discriminator uh, you know, uh, for promotion. There you have it straight from Sara major. He's the one who sits on boards. He's the one who says yes or no with his board members of uh, which is, could be your first sergeant or soon to be first sergeant. And they're going to say yes or no. So go out there and get it. Uh, Sara major, uh, what type of background do you need to have this type of job field before you apply for the MOS? What type of background you mean like a work experience or yeah do you need so it's kind of a funny question i get this as people coming off the street if i want to be a police officer in the military do i already have to be a police officer out in the civilian world yeah. so yeah. relating that to a cavalry scout do you need to have some kind of uh, job that pertains that carries over to a 19 delta no, I don't, I don't think so. I think you can, you know, come out of high school and, uh, you know, you just want to be a, a cover scout. Everything everything that you need to know, they're going to teach you. Exactly. There's exactly. No right on the nail. Again, the Army is going to teach you whatever you need to do for that job. So don't feel, uh, don't be afraid to come talk to a recruiter. Um, last couple questions, Star Major, because I know you got other things to do. Yeah. And I'm trying to uh, get through these as quick as I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah no problem. I hope I'm not keeping you up. If you if we need to go, we'll, we'll go. No, we're good. We're no problem. I, I'm I'm happy to do this. Okay. So being in the military for so long, what keeps you coming into the this job each day? Now remind our viewers, he is a sergeant major. He no longer does his uh, job that he came in. He does more of administration work. So being in the in this job and what you do, what is your motivation factor? Um. So. For me, and you know, maybe, uh, maybe I'm just uh, I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm overcommitted. I think once you get to to the position that I'm in, you're committed to the profession. You're no longer compliant, and I think they'll they'll teach you that once you go to basic training. So over time, the army just becomes a part of you, and then you get to the point where uh, you feel that the army gave you gave you a path for success, and you want to give back, and you want to make sure that those soldiers coming after you have the same opportunity. So that's what keeps me going, is to ensure that the soldiers in this brigade uh, have the best experience in the Army so they can look back and say, you know what, that time we were in 3rd Brigade, 10 Mountain Division, it, it was it was the best time because the leadership cared about us and they took care of us and they provided the opportunity so we could make a smart decision to make a career, make a profession out of being a soldier. So that that's... That's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me in the job uh, day after day. Yeah. So that kind of brings us to the the final end questions. Uh, you're you're so close for retirement now. Obviously, 20 years you get out, get a pension for the rest of your life. Um, but you're going beyond that. Uh, so and it's right around the corner. You can stay in for a couple more years, or you're getting out to do another job. What what are, what are, what are your thought process on that? What are you going to do? 
I don't know. We're still exploring options. Uh, so I, I, I got to start a uh, soldier for life at some point and see, see what pans out. But I would like to do something in the, you know, education field. I would like, I would like to teach another, some, some, uh, 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 military programs, you know, teaching, teaching kids, uh, you know, how to best integrate into the military. I know there's some of those military academies out there. That's what some of the, the some of my peers that have retired that are doing, that are enjoying. But really, I'm just open to anything. And I think uh, we'll see what happens in the next couple of years. But uh, like I say, I got to complete my degree first. Like it's, I think I think that that needs to be the first thing before I start looking for for mm -hmm. job options. Yep. And then uh, earlier on, we talked about your family. Uh, this is going to be a two part question here. How much family time did you have throughout your career? I know right now you don't have too much because of the position that you're at. But yeah. back, if you could think back, how much family time did you have? Yeah, so it, it depends on the assignment, and it's most definitely gotten better now than, than it was. Uh, you know, especially at the at the height of the uh, of the global war on terror. You know, early 2000s, 2015. So uh, we do have time with with our families. It's not different from any other job. The only time that you have limited time with families when you're deployed, you're in the field. But if you're not doing any of those, uh, there shouldn't be a reason why you're spending a whole lot of time, uh, you know, away from your family or your family waiting on you to come home because there's no reason for that. And that, and again, going back to the the mentality of this brigade, you know, we value families. Uh, we understand the importance of a family unit, uh, not only as, a, as an American society, but as a military society, the family unit. Are, are, are big to sustain the Army. So we ensure that the soldiers and leaders, uh, including ourselves, that we, we have the time to spend meaningful time uh, with our families every day. And uh, because we know that the time is going to come where we got to deploy to some foreign land and, uh, and be away from them. So we, uh, we maximize opportunities while we're here. Okay. And then I heard that your oldest son is in the Army. And that youngest son just graduated high school and got accepted to a college. Yeah, Congratulations. Yeah. You got both little birds out of the nest. Yep. Yep. So we're, we're about to be empty nesters. I don't know what my wife's going to do. Uh, so uh, I think we're going to have a lot of time to do all the things that we said we will do one day. So maybe take some dance lessons, go on a second honeymoon, you know, that sort of thing. I don't know what we're going to do. But uh, yeah, so my, my, my oldest son is in the Army, too. Uh, he's at Fort Campbell. He's a 25 uniform uh, uh, communication, signal communication specialist. And then my, my youngest one is on his way to college. He's going to Ohio State University uh, for uh, uh, biomedical engineering. Uh, so he's well on his way. So, so yeah, so, so we're good. So success, you know. So one, join the military. I mean, that's a prestigious profession. And then uh, we have our other one on his way to college. So very exciting. Now I want to let our viewers know that your son is going to college and not paying a penny out of his pocket because he is using your GI Bill. Yeah, so uh, one of the things I never got to do, obviously, was to get out of the Army and use my own GI Bill, but uh, uh, that is one of the options. So you can you can transfer your your post-9-11 uh, GI Bill benefits to, to not only one, you can give it to as many... Uh, uh, many of your dependents that you want. You can split it in many different ways so every one of them, even your spouse, can get some of that uh, uh, college money to further their education. So in the case of my youngest one, uh, you know, he took it all because my oldest one said, I don't want, I don't want the GIV. I want to make my own way, Dad. And I respect him for that. So he's making his own way and now he's got his own GIV. Yep. And he has his, I mean, he has all the benefits that you have. So, exactly. I mean, he Absolutely. He squared away. Yes. So um, I want to, this is your last chance, folks. This is a command sergeant major, Franco from 3rd Brigade, 10th Mountain, coming to you live from Fort Polk, Louisiana. You have about two minutes left to ask your questions to this uh, bright, bright NCO. I was going to say young man, but we're, in, we're a professional. <laughs> Uh, so ask your questions, you guys. This is the only time where, uh, I want to say not the only time, but this is a time where you can get candid with a Sergeant Major. Uh, for those who are watching this and are in the military, you know the respect that we give to these people that have achieved this rank. It is hard. They don't hand us out. You have to earn it. Um, and this man, with his career, he has done a lot. 
He has been places. He has achieved. I mean, things that I'm still trying to do in my career. And hopefully one day I'll be able to achieve that same position um, or some of the things that you done have done in your military career. It's just phenomenal, Song Ranger. Um, so any, any other questions? Going once. <laughs> All right. I will entertain this question. <laughs> uh, this is from a live question, Star Major. Uh, I guess this individual has heard a rumor. Um, why is it that anyone cannot walk on the grass? <laughs> uh, you don't have to entertain it if you don't want to, but I thought that was pretty funny because a couple people, civilians are like, hey, I've heard this rumor or what, is this true? And we're, we have to break it down. So if you don't want to answer, you're fine with me. I'm okay with skipping that one. Yeah, yeah. Hey, the grass got to stay fresh and it's got to stay cut, right? So you can't, you can't walk on it. <laughs> That's right. Um, all right, everybody. I appreciate you spending your hour with us. Thank you, Sergeant Major. You are a very busy man. For you to take an hour out of your day to talk to us about your job, your career, uh, I appreciate it beyond words. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, for our viewers, um, if you have a question, I mean, even though we're done with the segment, you can still ask your questions and we'll come back. If I can't answer them through my research, I'll hit up Command Sergeant Major Franco and we'll get those uh, questions asked or answered for you. OK, so if you're watching this uh, live, put down hashtag live. If you're rewatching this, push, uh, put down hashtag rewatch. And you have a question about joining the Army. Guess what? I'm an Army recruiter. I can recruit you out of state. So don't worry if you like us. We will be the team for you. Again, Sergeant Major, I appreciate you beyond words. Me and my team here, uh, we thank you for your time, uh, for your family and your kids. Uh, I wish them best of luck. And one day I'll be back at Fort, uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana again to say hi again. Appreciate yeah. everything you've done so far, Sergeant Major. Thanks for everything you're doing. Like, your job is not easy. And, you know, the, the Army does a good job uh, putting the right people in those jobs. And, that, and that's why you're there. So. Thank you for what you're doing and, and bringing quality soldiers into the Army. And uh, again, just for the people watching, uh, the Army needs Cavalry Scouts right now. So they're in high demand. So if you're on the fence, just uh, drop something and answer a question. And perhaps I can I can help you answer that question if you're still undecided. So, okay, you have a good rest of your day and Army strong. Cool. Army strong, you guys. Like I always say, we do a Soldier of the Hour every Tuesday from 4 to 5 on uh, the Pacific Coast timeline. Um, if you have a question, uh, you'll see us, uh, put down our commercials for who's we're interviewing next. Um, if you see an, M uh, MOS that you want to see it live through our program, put down a comment. We'll try to get, uh, a 19, uh, let's say a 31 kilo, a dog handler, or maybe a 31 Bravo, which is a military police officer. If you want to see those next, leave down a comment and we'll try to get those personnels on our show. Uh, like I always say, you guys, because if you're going to be a future soldier, you need to be at the right place, the right uniform, and on the right time. All right, you guys, until next week, have a great day and be safe. Bye-bye.